Let me welcome you all to tonight's lecture series, which is part of our ongoing educational outreach to the community. We're very excited about sharing tonight's program featuring Greg Pate of the 4W Forestry Group and the Tennessee Forestry Association. But first, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that this Saturday, the Conservancy is hosting the second event in our 2024 restoration series presented by Brother International Corporation with the 19th annual tree planting at New Chicago Park. Please see our website, wolfriver.org, for volunteer and registration information. I would also like to acknowledge all of our benefactors for 2024. They are the Crawford Howard Family Foundation, TC Energy, Bank of America, AutoZone, FedEx, the Hyde Family Foundation, Buckman, International Paper, Terminex, Jim Karras Subaru, Ring Container Technologies, Brother International Corporation, and Silvamo. A big thank you for their ongoing support. Of course, all of our supporters, corporations, individual donors, and volunteers are all critically important in allowing us to deliver on our mission, the protection and enhancement of the Wolf River watershed as a sustainable natural resource. As always, gifts of any size are appreciated. Please see our website at www.wolfriver.org give. And now a quick message from our presenting sponsor, Brother International Corporation. Brother is proud to partner with the Wolf River Conservancy to bring events like the Wolf River Restoration Series to life. This series not only improves the Wolf River ecosystem, but also in educates the community about the importance of protecting our planet with a fun, interactive approach. We share a strong bond with Wolf River's mission to promote environmental sustainability, and we are honored to be part of this program to support the Memphis community. And a few housekeeping details. We ask that you do not attempt to record this program with any device. It will be up on our YouTube channel uh, after the event. If you have any questions during the program, please use the Q&A feature and not the chat box. Our education director, Kathy, will be monitoring the questions and will ask them after the program. Now, it's my pleasure to present to you our speaker for this evening, Mr. Greg Pate. Greg is a registered forester in Alabama. He's been practicing forestry in the South for 40 years. After a long career, he retired from the North Carolina Forest Service as the state forester to become the state forester of Alabama, working for the Alabama Forestry Commission. He and his wife, Mary, began their own forestry business in 2016. Currently, Greg is working with the Tennessee Forestry Association as its conservation impact consultant. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Greg Pate. Thank you very much, Eric. And I, I am honored to uh, meet with all of you tonight and speak to this, this important topic. Uh, when Kathy first asked me about uh, talking to Wolf River Conservancy, I, I thought, well, you know, something along the lines of a legacy a project would be uh, be worthwhile. So, so I wanted to combine what we're doing with uh, Tennessee Forestry Association, uh, what landowners across Tennessee do, and, and what you're doing in leaving a legacy of the Wolf River uh, as a vibrant uh, and functioning ecosystem in the in western part of Tennessee. So, so thank you for for inviting me to come, and I appreciate the opportunity to to speak with all of you tonight. Uh, what I want to do is my, my title of the talk is Leaving a Forest Legacy and How Do I Begin? Uh, I want to try tonight to kind of combine uh, two major thoughts. One is landowners in Tennessee and how they manage their land, uh, what they do with their property, uh, how they leave a legacy for their uh, children and their children's children. And also, I want to talk a little bit about the legacy species that we're working with with the Tennessee Forestry Association. Uh, so I hope through my talk, I'll be able to combine both of those things into a sensible presentation that I hope you enjoy. Uh, one thing I will say is that landowners in Tennessee have changed over the last 20 years or so. 
prior to that point, investing in timber and uh, land investments were a very high priority when landowners were asked on surveys why they own their property. This has changed tremendously, and we're going to talk about that a good bit in detail also tonight. Uh, also, several surveys taken in the last uh, eight or 10 years or so have given have given some uh, very telling tales of what landowners know and don't know about managing their forest land, and not just forest land resources, but all the resources, and and how they go about doing that. So I want to this this presentation is going to hit on a little bit of all of those topics, but I hope you enjoy it, and I hope we can tie it all together in the end. First, let's look at just who owns the land, the forest land in Tennessee. There are, are a, over 13 million acres of forest in the state. Uh, some, some are in federal uh, holdings, about 1.4 million. About 800,000 acres belong to the state of Tennessee. About two and a half million, 2.4 million to be exact. Uh, are in corporate hands, that may be timber companies, that may be investment companies, that may be whatever it may, whatever that may be, a wide range of things, but corporate ownership. About 115,000 acres or so are owned by local government. And that leaves about 9.1 million acres. But uh, what we want to focus on tonight are the landowners family forest owners in Tennessee who own 10 or more acres. And so of that category, there's about 8.5 million acres in Tennessee that are owned by family forest owners. Now, some of the, some of the statistics I'm going to give you tonight come from the National Woodland Owner Survey. NWOS is a part of the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program of the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't heard of that, the Forest Inventory Analysis, FIA, is a continuous forest inventory of the United States dating back to the 1930s. Uh, and there have been several iterations of that federal law uh, between federal government and all the state governments. This forest inventory is, a, uh, is an effort on both their parts to maintain a current forest inventory of all the states. Uh, in the United States. The National Woodland Owner Survey, which is part of this, began in 1978. Uh, there, have been, uh, four, there have been four additional surveys since then of forest landowners in the United States, 94, 96, 2013, and the latest edition we have is 2018. And so it's pretty much time to start another uh, round of surveys. They're trying to keep them on five to six year intervals now. But this National Woodland Owner Survey looks at, looks at the who, who owns the property, why do they own the property, how, how, do, how did they come to have the property, what do they intend to do with it? And so we, we're going to look at this data for Tennessee, and, and we're also going to analyze this based on acres and owners. Uh, as you see on the slide, they're, they're about, as I said, 8.5 million acres of these forest land that's on the 10 acres or more owners, there's 193,000 such ownerships in Tennessee. Now there may be more than one owner in an ownership, but uh, the ownerships are 193,000 with 10 acres or more in Tennessee. And of those, you can see the breakdown of, of the owners and the acres. So 10 to 49, just to give you an example, if someone owns 10 to 49 acres, there are that encompasses 77 percent of all the all of those 193,000 owners. And it encompasses 31 percent of all those 8.494 million acres. And so that's the way to kind of read the graph. But you can see the land ownerships. Obviously, the larger landowners are not over a thousand acres is less than one percent and, and 500 to 990. 999, 999 acres or less than 1% also. So that's the size. Now, who are these folks? Who are the folks that own the property in Tennessee, the family forest owners? 
Well, the latest survey in 2018 says that 49% of these folks are over 65. So an, so an older, an older, almost a majority or an, or an older crowd. I just turned 65 this year. So I just joined that group. 47% have a college degree. 76% of the primary decision makers in those ownerships are male. And 15% reported themselves as a minority owner. Now, why do they own this property? This is the real major thing that has shifted over time. Uh, I think in the 1994 and even 2006 surveys, uh, timber production investment was one of the very main reasons that folks own property. But in the 2013, things started to change. And then in the 2018 survey, you can see that these objectives have changed tremendously. Uh, the number one thing that folks own their property for is just beauty or scenery. 79% of those ownerships own their property, said they own their property for that, for that purpose. 75% for wildlife habitat, 74% for nature protection, and then 57% for a family legacy. Now that's 57% of the owners, but it's 66% of all the for family forest ownership, owners, acres in Tennessee on their property to leave a family legacy. And that's kind of what we want to talk about tonight. Now, the other thing I've got at the bottom of that slide, I made a couple of points. The, the key concerns that go right in line with that, with all of those objectives is, what's my concern with, with how, I'm, how I want to manage my property and what I want to do? Property taxes, as, as with most of us, taxes is always number one, 81%. And the second thing at 75% is keeping their land intact. So 75% of these family forest owners who own eight and a half million acres, their second most concern in the survey was just keeping their land all together with all the development pressures that are going on. Now I mentioned, I mentioned one thing earlier about the change that has taken place in this, in the, uh, in the, 2006 National Woodland Owner Survey, uh, timber production was very high. On this 2018 iteration of that survey, uh, timber production is 21%. Only 21% of the owners uh, list timber production as, as a high priority for owning their property. So, but we've, we've looked at how owners who the owners are, how much land there is, why they own their property. Now let's kind of look at if if you wanted to to have a family legacy property, which in the way I look at things, uh, all the all the things above that family legacy uh, percentage are all really things that uh, kind of tie right into the family legacy, the beauty and the scenery, the wildlife habitat, the nature protection, all that really kind of ties into it. So let's how would you go about, how would I begin if I had no idea, if I own property and had no idea what I wanted to, to, uh, to leave to my children, how would I start? One of the, I have been working, as, as Eric said, I've been working in forestry for 40 years in the South. And this is by far the most important step that a family forest owner or a group of owners can take uh, is developing objectives to what their desired future outcome or condition of their forest resources and other resources are. Uh, I talk to landowners each and every month in my capacity now that really have given no thought to what they would like their land to be like in the future. And forest management, uh, land management, wildlife management, they're all processes. They're not an overnight thing. And so to think about them, have a plan, know how you want to get there, be able to see the end uh, before you begin are all extremely important things. 
So develop objectives for your desired uh, future condition of your forest land. Look at the trees and the timber, and we want to go through each one of these. You can read, and I'll go through each one and just give you some ideas of what to think about. I know this sounds simple, and you think people, well, surely people think about what they're going to do. You, you would be amazed at the number of people who do not sit down and just think about, talk about with other family members what they would like to see their property be like, even though they're going to keep it in their family for many generations. So in, in trees and timber objectives, what are some things you might consider? Well, do you have hardwood timber or do you have softwoods? Do you have pine? That, or what, and what do you want? If you have a certain uh, one of those and you want to transform it to a to a, a softwood to a hardwood stand, you want to transform a hardwood to a softwood stand, uh, then that's a process. And some of the recommendations that might be made to do that uh, would be different. So how do you intend to protect your trees from insects, disease, wildfires? You know, what are your forest health concerns? You know, as folks are walking through their uh, through their property, they see certain trees dying, they wonder what the heck's going on. You know, what what uh, have you given consideration to why that might be happening? Why trees might be dying? What, what kind of disease, what kind of insects may be attacking? So think about that. Do you, uh, as a forest landowner, uh, do you have, do, are you okay with harvesting timber and thinning or thinning your timber stands, keeping them healthy? Uh, you may actually need to do that to meet some of the other objectives. And so is, uh, is timber harvesting something that you would, uh, that, that would be good for your property that you wouldn't mind doing? Uh, timber harvest are always, uh, anytime I take a landowner that's never harvested and show them a timber harvesting site, they always think that it looks like a, a nuclear bomb went off, and sometimes that's true. Uh, but it's a necessary part of the management of the forest for the for the next stand. So it's uh, just a small necessary blip in time, but uh, but uh, to get where you want to go. Do you have invasive species on your property? Is that something that you would like to uh, to control? You know, if you if you have a, a sizable property, how do you uh, how do you want to regenerate for the next stand of trees to be the next forest stand? Again, this is a process, and so you can't just go and say, "Okay, I want to cut that stand tomorrow, and it's going to come back with exactly what I want." You really have a planning process there, but to get it down on paper and say. At some point in time, we want to take this group of trees and we want to harvest them and we would like X, an X species of trees to be in their place. Prescribe burning. Uh, familiarize yourself as a landowner with the uh, benefits of prescribed burning on your property. Uh, make sure that you're not averse, averse to burning. Uh, so you know, write that down as an objective or a question for someone you may speak to. So is burning part of your timber objective. You may have special stands of trees in your property. Uh, you may have uh, trees that may be getting more rare and rare, such as I can think of Eastern Hemlock is a species uh, that it has a, a woolly adelgia that's attacking it and most of the hemlock are, are dying out. So if you have a stand of hemlock that hasn't been attacked or one that you would like to protect with some uh, with some different methods, then you know, think about those special stands of trees that you have that you just want to protect. Do you want your forest to look like a park or would you like more of a closed canopy, cool, uh, cool understory? Uh, that's something that uh, that you need to kind of decide on. What's your objective? What would you like to do? On the wildlife side, would you like to manage for game species? Is that an objective you have? If you do, which, which ones? That will dictate what kind of management uh, processes can need to take place for you to get to that end result. Are you into bird watching? If you are, great. There's some different management uh, schemes that can be put into place to get your forest uh, better adapted to uh, migratory and uh, and local bird species. 
would you like to manage non-game species? Uh, there are a lot of the non-game species that are at risk in Tennessee. You know, some of the, the salamanders and some of the smaller uh, uh, reptiles, uh, they are uh, they're at risk of, of becoming threatened or endangered. Would you like to help manage those and conserve those species? Are there other threatened and endangered species on your property? There are some uh, there are there are some ways that you can find out uh, if if there are those species on your property. Some uh, and, and you can decide uh, if you want to manage to increase those species. And again, in wildlife management, is prescribed burning something that you would uh, would not be averse to on your property to help the, the wildlife. What about waters, river, waters, rivers, creeks, streams? Do you have those on your property? How do you intend to use those water resources? Do you recreate on them? Do you just love to walk by the creek and see the scenic beauty? What, what do you like to do? Uh, how do you intend to protect those water resources while other forest uh, management, wildlife management activities are going on on your property? How would you uh, think to do that? Just talk, uh, Talk amongst yourselves as owners and come up with a game plan of, hey, I won't, you know, I've got this beautiful creek, but it is just so beautiful. I never want to see any trees harvested within a hundred feet of my creek. And I just, I just love to walk down there and uh and 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 just look at look at nature. How are you going to access across those water resources to get to other parts of your property? Is there already existing roads and bridges? Uh Fords, are there ways that you can better improve that access uh, to get from one side of your property to the other? And again, in, in the water, there are, in Tennessee, there are uh, a great wealth of endangered and threatened species in the streams. Uh, so is that something that you want to manage for? Think about that in your objectives. Recreational objectives. Are you a hunter? If so, write that down as something that you would really like to do forever and ever. Do you like to fish? Do you have water resources on your property that you can fish in and you want to manage that? Do you do you like trails? Do you want to do you like to walk? Do you like to four-wheel? Do you like to to ride the side by side? What kind of access vehicle type do you need on those trails? Are you into birding? That uh, that's a great objective to have, and uh, one that can be managed very well for. But we need you need to know that ahead of time, so you can start with the end in mind. Do you have scenic areas for picnics or family gatherings that you could uh, protect and uh, expand upon and manage to uh, leave them there for uh, your future generations? Aesthetics and scenic uh, objectives. Do you, again, do you want it to be a, like a park or would you like to have a closed canopy forest? Do you like native ground cover? Wild shrubs, wildflowers, uh, different management regimes would be put in place to manage for those. Are there special sites to your family? Do you have an old home place on the property? Is there a Native American site there? What would you like to protect and what would you like to enhance? Do you have walking trails? Would you like to install walking trails? Do you have the species of trees that produce beautiful fall colors? If you do and you love fall colors and you like to hike through the, your property and just look at fall colors, that needs to be an objective. And if you're looking at aesthetics and scenic objectives, how, you know, how do you minimize uh, the effect of timber harvest so that uh, you can screen, buffer uh, the places that you like to walk until that uh, timber harvest heals over, the next stand comes into place. Uh, those are things to consider. Some people put these down in their objectives, but educational. You know, some folks, oh, not many, but some folks open their, open their property to public access. You know, and, and that's great. I know several of, of the folks that I work with do that, and, and they are uh, they are richly blessed. 
by educating uh, adults and the new generation of students coming up. So would you like to sponsor or organize environmental programs? Is that an objective you have for your property? Would you like to develop uh, areas of uh, demonstration for forest management, wildlife management, uh, stream protection, whatever those areas may be? Would you like to put in an outdoor classroom? Would you like to have nature trails? Uh, public access areas, again, open to the public or just public access for those who come on your property for educational purposes during those times. You know, what's the access they have to get to the different sites on your property? And this is something that I won't say it's an objective, but I will say that it's something that most folks that I speak with over 40 years don't really think about is uh, protecting their property for the future. I mentioned to you earlier that one of the biggest concerns of forest landowners in Tennessee is uh, keeping their land intact. And so how do they protect that? How do they protect it from development? How do they protect it from, you know, being sold off, whatever it is, by the next generation? Conservation easements are a great tool to do that. I am not an expert. These folks on the webinar are. I'm not. Uh, we are working also with the current project that we're working with a couple of uh, of uh, land trusts that, uh, that help with conservation easements. So if that's something that that you would like, then I know those folks uh, would be glad to talk to you about that. And in those conservation easements, you know, you can have a working forest where you're managing for all the objectives you have, or you can just just have a preserve. So which, which would you like to do if you're putting your objectives down? So all those things, uh, again, simple. Uh, most folks just don't think to sit down and take the time to put that list together. But once you do, and then you take the next step of seeking the advice from, from a natural resource professional that can help you to build that forest legacy, that gives that professional or those professionals a wealth of knowledge about your thoughts and your feelings about the property that they can design a, a management scheme to get you where you want to go. One of the things that landowners mention often in surveys that are taking is that they don't know what to do to manage their property. And sometimes they just don't trust the folks that are, uh, that are the natural resource professionals. And so what I would say to landowners is just seek the advice from several folks, <clears throat> build relationships with those that you trust. Many folks offer their services for free many of the state and federal organizations. They offer services for free or at very low cost. Uh, they, they, landowners in Tennessee, uh, can, can usually get most, uh, can usually get most every professional resource they need with the exception of timber harvest or a timber marking or uh, prescribed burning, uh, pretty much at, at anything to do with management recommendations based on what your objectives are, uh, any type of soil and timber stand mapping that you may need, written management plans. Most of those things can be had if you're willing to wait uh, at little to no cost. There's also financial assistance that these natural resource professionals uh, can guide you towards that will help fund completing many of the activities that you may want to achieve in your objectives. And they can also assist you in locating different vendors uh, to complete the different activities. Uh, prescribed burning it, season is on in the South now. Uh, Normally runs from about uh, January through uh, through leaf leaf break uh, when it gets too warm. But uh, so that is a hot commodity is prescribed burning in the South now, and so uh, 
in Tennessee, there are not that many vendors who do actually do prescribe burning on property, which is one of the very best and cheapest management tools that we as foresters and wildlife biologists uh, have in our in our arsenal to uh, to manage a great number of the objectives you may want to achieve as a landowner. So all these things can be had, but seek that advice from someone that you trust. And if you don't trust, you know, the first guy, if, if I come out there and you just don't like me very well, just, just get somebody else, but find somebody that you can trust and build that relationship with them. Uh, I got into forestry school because I like nature and I wanted to walk through the woods and do all that kind of stuff. But it didn't take me very long to find out that a forester's job is people. Uh, I don't think any of the, uh, any of the careers that many of us have been involved with have not found out that same thing to be true, that uh, it's nice to have the knowledge uh, and the science, but uh, the people skills are the thing that uh, that will lead you most in, in your life is having those people skills to have folks who will trust that, that you do what you say you're going to do. And I have always tried to do that. So here are, here are a few organizations that that do help uh, landowners. The Tennessee Forestry uh, Division of Forestry, they have foresters who uh, who can come out and give you those that kind of advice. Now, there's only a few of them in the state, and so it sometimes takes a little while for them to, to get there, but, but they are there and they're willing to help. The Natural Resource Conservation Service, the NRCS, they have a wealth of different resource professionals that can help do a, a myriad of things for you. Uh, they can help with uh, resource planning for any type of resource need you may have. They have biologists, they have uh, in Tennessee, they have just hired, I think three foresters across the state who can help family forest owners with, uh, with NRCS priorities across the state. They can help you with uh, putting together your priorities and your objectives. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they have wildlife biologists who work with private landowners. They have a program called the Partners for Fish and Wildlife, uh, and they have biologists in Tennessee who can help you on your property. Uh, just give them a call. There are private consulting foresters. Many of them will charge a fee uh, for doing those services. Well, all of them will charge a fee for doing certain services, but some will, some will meet you at no cost and uh, talk to you about objectives. And then if you want to proceed from there with doing a management plan or doing some other planning that they may do, they would uh, they would share with you their, their charges. There are others around the state who have foresters and biologists that are available to help you. Just reach out to the, reach out to some of these folks and they can steer you. If they can't help you, just like we do, we steer you to someone else who can help you. Now the Tennessee Forestry Association, excuse me, who I'm associated with, has recently entered into the landowner technical assistance area. Uh, we just, in the last four years, we began we began to work with for family forest owners in Tennessee, uh, just just to work one on one with them and help them leave a forest legacy. Uh, we're looking to achieve conservation impact on on properties. The first project that we did, and most of our projects are kind of geographic based so far. Some are statewide, but our conservation impact projects to date have been kind of geographically located. The first one we did was the Duck and Elk River watershed in South Central Tennessee, 13 county area. We partnered with the Tennessee Division of Forester, Forestry and some private consulting foresters. The, the real impact of this grant was, was to work with uh, landowners who scored high. We did some a good bit of extensive GIS work and found that, that many landowners in that part of the state of Tennessee they, they scored very high on uh, riparian uh, restoration score. We were looking at areas to repair uh, or restore the riparian forest in that part of Tennessee. And so we were able to provide technical and financial assistance to those landowners to give them uh, 
give them the advice and some of the dollars that they needed to do that. Uh, all of that was to, to help to manage uh, the riparian forest for, as, as I mentioned earlier, those at-risk wildlife species, mainly aquatic species in that part of Tennessee. It was a very successful program. We met with 216 forest owners over, over a two year period. Uh, we looked at almost 45,000 acres. We offered them those that advice and recommendations and some financial assistance. Uh, we were able to achieve conservation impact activities on over 20,000 acres in those couple of years. And there's just a few of us working on that project. So we're extremely proud uh, Candace Dinwiddie, who is the executive director of the Tennessee Forestry Association, uh, she and her board of, of directors were extremely proud in that project that they uh, that they oversaw and took place took uh, that took place in South Central Tennessee. So we have begun a new project, and uh, when Kathy talked to me, uh, one of the things she talked to Candace about, I think at first was the white oak. And I said, well, we certainly will want to talk about that, but I really, really want to talk about more. And so now we are working on a project uh, with the with two Tennessee legacy tree species uh, in our current conservation impact project. Uh, white oak and shortleaf restoration on family forest is a grant uh, through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that uh, we began last year uh, with the help of, uh, as you see on the screen, many, many uh, wonderful sponsors who are helping us either contribute uh, in, in kind services, contribute cash to help uh, meet uh, the matching needs of the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant. The, uh, the white oak and shortleaf restoration on family forest <coughs> currently is serving 29 counties uh, in the Cumberland Plateau and the Highland Rim of Tennessee. And you see the counties here. Unfortunately, we're not quite as far west as, you, as, uh, as the Wolf River is now. But we cert we have been working, <clears throat> Tennessee Forestry Association has been working on a statewide White Oak initiative over the last few years also. And we hope to combine this, this project with, uh, with the new project that we have going on uh, from, from NIFWIF and expand this to other areas of Tennessee in the coming years. So keep your ears and eyes open so more, more to come. Uh, on that. So why would we want to work on shortleaf pine? Uh, shortleaf pine has the largest historical range of any southern yellow pine. And there's, uh, has about a historical range of about 22 million acres. Uh, so that's a very wide range uh, of, of shortleaf pine. Uh, all the way from New Jersey to uh, to Texas is the range of shortleaf pine, and then north up to uh, to Tennessee. In the last <clears throat> in the last fifty years, we have lost about half of the acreage of shortleaf pine dominated forest in the in in the United States. I think the last estimate I saw is about twenty two acres uh, a day we're losing of shortleaf pine in the, in the historical range. And so we're down now to about only about 6 million acres of shortleaf dominated forest uh, in the United States. And so we're trying to work with uh, you know, as many partners as we can to, uh, to revive this, uh, <clears throat> this legacy species, which is, which is a great species as the other Southern yellow pines are. It's used in the same kind of, uh, of uh, products that the other yellow pines are. The one, the one thing about shortleaf that makes it unique is it, it grows tall and straight, and it's usually uh, one of the better species of uh, Southern yellow pine for, uh, for poles. And so it makes a very high quality uh, 
product uh, in the end for landowners. Shortleaf grows in pure stands sometimes, but more often than not in Tennessee, it's associated nat in natural stands with white oak and, and other oak species. Uh, the one, another interesting thing about shortleaf pine is it's, <clears throat> it's the only Southern yellow pine that has the ability to sprout from a bud below the ground if, if it's injured by fire or if it's cut. Uh, you see this, <clears throat> and I got this slide over here with the arrow. This is a, a shortleaf pine seedling, just a one year old seedling. You can see the, the top of it here comes down through the hand and then it has a crook. Now, a lot of the root system has been torn off of this. Obviously it was pulled out of the ground, but uh, you see the crook and then you see the root system and the tap root that goes down. Uh, no other yellow, no other pine has this crook. Uh, Shortleaf is the only one. I remember uh, I used to run a nursery program about uh, 20 years ago in the state of North Carolina and we would grow these short leaf and we'd send them out to folks to plant and they thought they were all defective and uh, we got question after question about it and we, we would have to go every time and no they're they're fine they naturally grow this way where the era is 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 kind of the ground line of where uh, just above where, where the pointer is the ground line would be and so if they're planted here if they were to get Bit off, bitten off by a, a deer or burned, then there's buds at this crook that are gonna break and they're gonna create a new tree, just like a hardwood tree would sprout. This this short leaf will sprout. It's the only Southern yellow pine that will do that sprouting. And so it makes it real conducive to uh, prescribed burning. If they're burned and damaged by the, the fire, they will sprout right back. Now, why, why white oak? White oak is obviously a key species of, of Tennessee, living over 200 years. 180 birds and mammals use it for uh, for food. I heard it was like 27% of some of the uh, mammals' diets every year. Uh, the wood of white oak is impervious to liquids, uh, so it imparts a great flavor to whiskey and bourbon. I'm sure you all know that. Uh, and so the bourbon and whiskey industry is very interested in maintaining the white oak uh, in, in future forest stands. The unfortunate thing is we have, well, we have plenty of white oak now that are mature. The problem is the current way that most folks manage their timber stands does not lend itself to support a new generation of white oak. And we'll talk about that in, uh, in just a second. Our effort is to, to is several fold. We raise an awareness with uh, landowners through projects like this, these webinars and educational events that we may have that we have in person each year, to give you opportunities to learn more about the solutions and what we're trying to do. Uh, we're doing outreach to individual family forest owners through different marketing techniques. Uh, we provide technical assistance through. We, through foresters that work for our program uh, to meet with individual forest landowners and talk about their objectives and what kind of legacy and talk to them about white oak and shortly. We also have financial assistance that's available to uh, landowners to uh, promote, uh, plant, uh, do different things with short leaf and, and white oak. We give you recommendations when we come out to meet. Uh, to support your forest legacy objectives that hopefully you've learned in previous slide that we need to have kind of have ready. We want to build relationships, long-term relationships with landowners. We have found that we can multiply our effort to get the word out if we can build a good relationship with an influential landowner who can then spread that word to their neighbors and their and their peers. So that peer-to-peer -peer learning is one thing that we're really trying to build upon in this project is uh, teach, teach one person and they can teach four or five and then they can teach 20. We also provide financial assistance for planting white oak <coughs> and short leaf prescribed burning uh, that is important in managing these species. And in timber stand improvements such as Mid-story removal, I was mentioning that the oaks are, are not uh, an easy thing to come into the next stand. 
you see this photo in the upper right of this uh, of this collage that I have here. Those are all white oak seedlings on the ground. And the way that was achieved is the mid-story trees were removed from that stand and a few of the overstory to give sunlight to the ground. And white oak uh, needs sunlight about 30 to 50 percent to regenerate and grow in an understory of a forest. And so the, the idea is to keep that amount of sunlight on these seedlings as they grow to five to 10 feet tall, then they can be released into the overstory where they will compete well and do well in the next stand. But many folks don't have white oak in their stand now or either usually when, when we come to visit, the, the timber may have already been harvested and there may have been white oak in the stand that we could have done something with. But if they're just now thinking about managing the white oak after they're, they've harvested their timber stand, they're about 15 years too late. So begin early because it's a process. And you see the other things that we can provide financial assistance for in our, in our program also. <clears throat> this, uh, I just wanted to put up <clears throat> our kind of our main marketing postcard that we send out uh, to, to folks in the counties. Uh, I would say this to, to all of you, many of you may be from all over and, and maybe not many of you are in those counties that I showed you, but some of you may be landowners in Tennessee. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We want to, uh, we want to be a clearing house to get you the information and the resources that you need. If you're not in a county that we're currently working on, we, we will normally work a county over adjacent to the counties that, uh, that are under the geographic area of this, of this grant project. We'll normally work the adjacent counties, but once we get a couple of counties over, it's a little too far for, for us to, uh, to count in our, in our deliverables, but we do want to help you. And so if you, uh, if you have, something you would like to know if you want if you have forest land and you'd like to know who can help you we can we can certainly provide some trusted resources for you uh to get started uh on your forest legacy project so if you want to learn more uh please visit tennesseeforestry.com and just go to white oak initiative uh we got several uh resources on there uh, this, uh, you can open your camera and scan this QR code that will take you to a, uh, to an online, um, kind of registration page that you can, uh, can fill in some information about your property and about you. And, and we will certainly reach out to you and help you even, you know, even if you're not in these counties, we want to try to help you steer you to the right people who can help. Again, as I said about the person who had harvested the timber and wanted white oak, you know, they were 15 years too late. And, so, you know, don't be 15 years too late. You know, get started today with what your legacy wants to be like 15, 20, 50 years from now. And I hope I've given you some ideas on how to do that. And if there's any way that we can help you with Tennessee Forestry Association, my contact information is there. And I will uh, will be glad to reach out to you and help you any way we can. And I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Greg. That was just great. Let me come on here. Okay, we have a few questions. Um, first of all, how much land does a landowner need to use the service? And I, I guess she means uh, Tennessee Forestry Association. Tennessee Forestry Association. We <clears throat> we don't we don't have a limit. Uh, we have been. We will help you. Uh, we are looking at we are looking at land that's fifty to seventy five acres or more is what we are looking at. But if someone has ten acres or fifteen acres, we will find the resource professional in your area that can help you. If you're even in those counties that we're in, we may direct you to a resource professional that can help you at no charge to take a look at your problem. Okay. Um, and related to that, 
is count do county extension services help with this kind of thing or not? Their county extension, most of their role is an educational role. They do have a limited number of foresters across the state, very, very few, just mm -hmm. just handful, one handful. Uh, but they're pretty much limited to educational outreach. Okay. But I, but I have known them to go to a property for a to, with 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 usually a norm, another resource professional just to give advice. I see. Okay, and then um, what two questions about the trees you were discussing? Why did we lose the short leaf pine? Why did so many disappear? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you answer that one first. And then yeah, I'll yeah, I will. I will. Short leaf is a <clears throat> is a species that uh, once harvested. In years past, it was a lot more difficult to regenerate, much like lonely. And so it was much easier to regenerate artificially, which most folks did 50 years ago, with loblolly pine because it was easy, it survived well, it thrived, it competed well. Short leaf is a little bit slower to get started. And as you saw that crook, you know, everybody doesn't like to put that crook in the ground. So it was just a harder species to plant. And so transitional logging to loblolly pine instead of short leaf or long leaf. That's why we lost a lot of long leaf also, but also just the development pressures, you know, so much development pressures in the South. Well, that, that, well, just think from New Jersey down through the Gulf States over to Texas, think of how much development's taken place there in the last 50 years. I mean, we've just, we've lost a lot of forest land just to development. And, and short leaf is no exception to that. Right. And then uh, the White Oak Initiative. Um, it seems to me that I had read something about collecting acorns. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of us who don't have land yet anyway, uh, would like to help white oaks thrive. Yeah. yeah. The, the Tennessee Forestry Association had a program uh, a couple of years ago that lasted well, three years ago, maybe that lasted a couple of years where they were partnering with the Tennessee division of forestry who has a nursery in uh, Delano and they grow tree seedlings there. They were, they were getting landowners around the state to collect acorns and send them in. And then they transported them to the Tennessee division of forest nursery where they, they planted them. I think it was a very successful program. Uh, they did not do it this past year. But Candace has told me that they are looking to uh, do that once again, either this coming year or the following year. And so you, you can kind of imagine the logistics that go behind collecting from a lot of different places all over the state, but they are working on that acorn collection. And so you may be hearing more about that in, the, okay. in this coming year. That's exciting. It's a way for lots of people to contribute. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And there's some great old historic white oak trees that folks could collect from that would be wonderful to have yeah. the seed from. Yeah, maybe a good way to preserve genetic diversity. Yeah, too. absolutely. absolutely. Um, here's a good question. Is the forest assist program still a good resource? Forest assist, it, yeah. Forest assist. It's Well, it's spelled it's forest asterisk, capital A asterisk, S Y S T. I am not familiar with that. Okay, so Aaron, if you want to give us any more details, and he, if he can tell me a little more, it might jog something in my memory. But I. Okay, here it is. It says the Tennessee Forest Assist Program is a cooperative project of the University of Tennessee Extension, Tennessee Department of Agriculture, Forestry Division, Tennessee Wildlife. Resources Agency, the Natural Resource, just okay. NRCS. and I, uh, I, I am not familiar. I am not familiar with that, Aaron. I, I don't. I do not know. Okay. Well, good. I'll have to look into that too. Um, and then um, finally, oh, here's another question from Aaron. Let's see. Hang on, Aaron. Let me scroll down. There we go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he says thank you. And then if you could comment, since we are a land trust at Wolf River Conservancy, what, what do you think the role of land trusts is in helping 
uh, small forest owners or any forest owner. And also in, in talking to landowners, how do you think land trusts are perceived by forest owners? I, in, in that change that I spoke about over the last 20 years of, of just landowners looking at different things besides timber production and income and those kind of things, I have heard more uh, interest in, well you, well, you saw that, you know, most landowners want to know how to keep their land intact, you know, and I think conservation uh, land trust, those, they, they play a vital role in doing that. You know, there's only so much funds to go around for that. But I hear more and more and more landowners that I speak to are looking at or have looked at the possibility of a conservation easement on their property. Uh, so I, I think the role uh, that you have is great. And we are, I mentioned we're working, Land Trust of T for Tennessee is working with us on this White Oak and Shortleaf project. And so, uh, we're kind of scratching each other's back. You know, if we get landowners who are really interested in a conservation easement, we steer, we steering them to them to, uh, to get more information. And they find folks that want management of short leaf and white oak, they're kind of helping us. And so I, I think that's what we all have to do in the natural resource world is just work together with each other to get the best outcome for the landowner, what, whatever that outcome is that they want. And so I, I, I think the land trust and the, the conservation organizations play a, a vital role in doing that more, more and more so. That's that's great to hear. It's uh, it's good news. But yeah, and I, was, yeah. I was very uh, happy to see that so many people just care about uh, the, preserving the natural features on land. No. Um, yeah, that was it's good news. Okay, well that's it for the questions. So I I believe so. Thank you so much, Greg. That was just a wonderful presentation. Thank, um, thank you all very much. I enjoyed it tremendously. If I can help you in any way, let me know. Okay, I'm going to turn you back over to Eric. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Greg, uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for your time. I know our viewers appreciated it, uh, and our staff here at the Conservancy appreciates it as well. Uh, folks, thank you again for joining us uh, for February's edition of our uh, Wolf River Conservancy webinar. Uh, again, a quick reminder, we are hosting our 19th annual tree planting out at New Chicago Park this Saturday. Please visit our website for more details there. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thanks.